Welcome to everybody. Um, my name is Marta Brenner. I'm the college librarian at Skidmore College in upstate New York. I'm also the past chair of the oversight committee for Lever Press. And uh, so I'm going to be your MC today, as well as a co-presenter. I'm going to uh, introduce you to our um, presenters and uh, what they're going to be telling us. And um, please, along the way, um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we will save time for Q&A at the end and encourage you to use the raise hand function um, so that we can make sure we don't overlook you. So we are recording this session, by the way. Uh, so I am joined by uh, Beth Bulukos, who is uh, from Amherst College, and she's the director of Lever Press. She'll be giving us an overview of the press and providing insight into the acquisitions process and publications. Then uh, Darren Hayton is from Haverford College, where he is the associate professor and chair of the history department, and he serves as the chair of our editorial board. So he'll be describing our editorial process. And uh, Charles Watkinson, uh, should he arrive, is going to be able to um, share information about the Fulcrum publishing platform and what's, what it has enabled us to accomplish. And as you can see, he is the um, Associate University Librarian for Publishing and Director of University of Michigan Press. Uh, and I will also be talking a bit about our shared governance model, our membership model, and um, I'll round out by um, reinforcing, uh, hopefully, what we'll tell you along the way about our values. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Beth to get us started. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me here a little bit more about Lever Press. I'm going to give a really broad overview of what it is that we do at Lever Press. So for those of you, I see a couple of you on that I definitely recognize and know may know a lot more about Lever. So if you have any more specific questions, I'm really happy to answer them at the end. Next slide, please. So the real basics for us are that we are completely open access. Every text that we do is made available digital first, completely open access, regardless of whether or not anyone is a member of our Lever Consortium. And everything we do is peer reviewed. So we are a member of the Association of University Presses and we abide by all the same standards that the other members abide by, meaning that everything is sent out for external peer review and then it goes to our faculty board um, for final approval. And uh, Darren will talk a little bit more about that process. So we never have any fees to authors or their institutions. Um, and that is something that we talk a lot with potential authors about because this platinum model is so rare. And so they're always thinking in the beginning sometimes that it's almost too good to be true that they could do their book open access without coming up with a really large subvention. Um, because with other members of the Association of University Presses, the range is anywhere from six, thousand dollars to about 15 plus thousand dollars to do your book open access. So we can go to that wheel now. So this is the entire sort of publishing uh, research ecosystem and I think it's a good visualization that explains why we think this model is really right for the current moment. So of course, all of this work comes out of archives and libraries, and that then is returned through our process back to users and broadly to the researching public as well. So you can go to the next slide. So what's really unique about us is that Almost all of the 150 some members of the Association of University Presses, except for three, are located at big comprehensive universities. And so because they are uh, market-based, which we are not, sometimes the needs and opportunities of the liberal arts are underrepresented. So some presses have started publishing less in certain areas because they're not viable on the market, for instance. And we also want to think about how pedagogy and other um, sort of interests of liberal arts institutions broadly can be represented at a university press. So that'll bring us to our next slide. 
So these are our current titles that we have out and to highlight the different sort of nature of what we're doing as a liberal arts press with this liberal arts ethos is for example, the open access musicology project is one that is quite unique in that all of the work was sent out for external peer review to scholars working in the field, but then also to students. And so the texts were used in classes and then vetted by students and they expressed what they thought could be changed for these works to be used in class in a more productive way. And so I think that's a really sort of unique type of approach to how you can get students involved in the process of working in publishing. Essentially, they're serving as the external peer reviewers as well. And then for this new Sophocles translation we have, which is on the upper left hand side of this slide, this is translated by two professors from Vassar and the translation is accompanied by a really nice dramatic reading by a group of students at Vassar. So that is on Fulcrum, at Fulcrum as supplemental um, resource that people can access. And there is a transcription as the students are reading as well. So, this sort of brings me to Fulcrum, which if Charles um, joins us, he'll talk a little bit more about. But another unique feature of Lever is that we enable our authors to incorporate multimedia. And so a project like Make It New, which is a little hard to read the, the titles on this slide, but is a book about new jazz. And so each of the chapters has a clip that goes in the Fulcrum version that is included as a resource. So it might be a performance of one of the jazz musicians that the author talks about, or there are parts of documentaries about these musicians. And so they're really nice resources also for classroom use, but for a, a general reader who might not be an expert in the field. And we found that, of course, the usage for these titles is far, far beyond and exceeding what they would do if they were released only as university press, um, print and ebook without open access. So we can move to the next slide. One thing that I should have mentioned actually is also that um, we're, we're publishing the titles that you've seen is that we are publishing both in the humanities and social sciences. And so our active acquisitions have been in those areas. Those are the areas that our series also lie in. But that's not to say that we wouldn't consider doing a project that, for example, brings up a topic in science and, and brings it to a sort of larger public that is not initiated in the field that uh, the topic is talking about. So another really unique feature of Lever Press is that we are modeling the types of partnerships that can come about with a new system of academic publishing. And so we are partnered with Amherst College Press which is part of the Frost Library at Amherst College, as well, of course, with Michigan Publishing Services. And so we are really trying to combine all of our strengths so that we have this library-based, media-rich, digital publishing uh, venture that is both sustainable and durable. So we can go to the next slide. So this is an impact map that was pulled April 15th. So a little bit after many institutions went virtual. And one thing we saw is that our usage increased dramatically after that took place. And so another thing that you can see, this is only sort of a, a moment in time, but you'll see that there's a really wide readership. And there are times when we pull the map when there are readers that are um, accessing our texts on on every continent except Antarctica. And that's really exciting. We get very excited when that happens. And so you'll see, for example, um, normally there's very good usage in South Asia and other geographic areas that aren't represented here, but this gives you a bit of a range of where our texts were being used at that moment when many went virtual. And these were pulled um, right the morning of the last webinar we gave. And again, gives you a bit of an idea of the range of our texts and where they're being used as well. So we can go to the next slide. 
And another thing that we're really focusing on with our version of Platinum Open Access, because there are no fees to authors or their institution, is really getting to the heart of this great quote by Alexia Hudson Ward, who was on our oversight committee before she left for MIT libraries. And she said that Lever Press adv advances the value of liberal arts and the value of an open access press as central to equity and inclusion. Lever Press is an equalizer. And as I mentioned before, there are faculty members who would love to do their projects open access, but they can't come up, especially in the humanities and many humanistic social sciences, with that $15,000 to make their book available open access. And and so we really see this model as a way for everyone to be able to do their work open access if it's a right fit for their project and a right fit for us. I think we have one more slide we can advance. Oh, then this is- We're ready for, for Darren to take over. Thanks, Beth. Thanks. So uh, yeah, thanks for taking some time out of your afternoon. If it's afternoon where you are and morning, if it's morning where you are. Uh, I'm the I'm Darren Hayton. I'm the chair of the editorial board, uh, and I want to say it's you know it's really exciting to be part of Lever Press. I've been around since the editorial board was first constituted um, some time back um, when we met in a uh, windowless cinder block building in, in Ann Arbor. Um, we've come a long way since then, uh, and I just want to talk about quickly about what what it looks like on the editorial board. You see the list of of current members. The the membership um, changes and adjusts now and then as people cycle on and cycle off. I wanna highlight how what we, our current list of, of members includes people from HBCUs and professors of education, um, professors of women and gender studies at women's colleges, political scientists at, at other small schools. Most of us are coming from the liberal arts. So the editorial board, liberal arts colleges. So the editorial board is constituted by members of faculty of our member institutions. And that makes it a really rich and robust and I think uh, engaged editorial board because what we have is a commitment to the liberal arts mission and ethos. And that informs all of the discussions we have around proposals and, and external reviews and projects that Beth and, and Hannah bring to us. Uh, and what that means is when we come into, when we encounter any of these projects, we're thinking about the values that Beth has already mentioned, values that Lever Press holds near and dear. Highest quality scholarship that's rigorously peer reviewed by a, a board, we're, we're very much a hands-on board. Sustainable scholarship and a sustainable model. Sustainable in both directions from the perspective of authors who uh, want, will produce the, the high quality scholarship that we publish, but also sustainable from the reader side of the issue. We have, an, an, we have a number of top texts that, and, and Beth's already mentioned this, that we think of as playing really important roles in liberal arts educational missions. They are, we're no longer, we are not, because we are born digital projects, we are not beholden to the notion that a book must be X number of pages and must be of certain heft. We can imagine books that have lots of individual pieces that will get parceled out in uh, educational situations as needed. The new jazz or the musicology are two of the, the projects that Beth has mentioned that I would, I would echo here. Um, and, and I wanna say that again, we have these conversations when we look at, at material that comes before us, when Beth brings us uh, external re readers reports, we have these conversations about how does this project that we're looking at, not only is it rigorous, but how does it advance the mission of and the values of Lever Press? And these are uh, grounded in this nice diverse array of, of faculty who come to Lever Press committed to those values, but from the sort of their particular perspective of the, the institution where they are a professor. And that makes for incredibly robust conversations as we, as we reflect on them. And these conversations often, these, when we look at these, these projects, often include thinking about how explicitly or precisely will this project advance the, the mission that we think Lever Press is engaged in. We do more, however, than, 
then just review external manuscripts, uh, the report, I should say, review the, the reader's reports of external manuscripts. Not infrequently, Beth will bring us, as she did recently, a proposal. And it gives us an excellent opportunity to think about, okay, what's the value of this proposal? What's the, what's the possible payoff? How does the proposal itself meet with our goals and aspirations? And when it does, what are the next steps forward? When it doesn't, um, we however also think about what are the next steps forward? What can we do with this proposal? Um, how can we respond to the person who, who submitted it in a way that's going to be generative? Because I think one of the things that we the board are really committed to is not just producing the highest quality scholarship, but facilitating and encouraging the highest quality scholarship from scholars aimed at and really targeting this, this broader notion of the liberal arts mission. Uh, and so those are the, these are the, the broader contours of the conversations we have on the editorial board whenever we see a, a project, whenever a project brought to us, whether it's a, at the proposal stage or it's uh, to review the reader's reports. And in these, in these conversations, we never lose sight of the values that, that Beth has already mentioned and that I've, I've tried to gesture to, notions of open access, accessibility. Um, if Charles makes it, he will talk about how these, these, the books that we produce in the electronic form, the ebook, are completely coherent. And so you aren't, that is, you can take the bit with you in a way that allows you to use the material, whether or not you have a high-speed internet connection live all the time, because we're, we're committed to these, these notions of accessibility and, and reach. Uh, notions of born digital, uh, how can we think about scholarship that moves beyond text that might be illustrated by images or illustrated by audio, and rather incorporates audio, visual, and other material into the very argument. And here I think uh, one of our board members, Jason Mitchell, who's on Film and Media Studies, is really pushing us regularly to think about the, the way that we can make our projects take advantage of the born, born digital aspect. I could go on, but I, I think I'll sort of wrap things up there and, and happy to talk about questions. I, I just wanna say once again, this is a, it's a great board. It's, it's a dynamic board and it's one that really takes seriously both our individual memberships in liberal arts institutions and the liberal arts ethos of the press. Thanks. Thanks so much, Darren. And Charles is indeed here. So I'm gonna turn it over to him next to talk about Fulcrum. Thank you very much, Marta. And uh, apologies for giving people pause. I was lurking, uh, but not visible. But uh, uh, so I'm Charles Watkinson. I'm Associate University Librarian for Publishing at University of Michigan. And uh, we're very proud to be the infrastructure partner uh, of Lever Press. And uh, Lever uh, actually deserves to have a fulcrum um, and Fulcrum is the publishing platform which Lever Press has been instrumental in building. And uh, as you've heard from Darren and Beth, Lever Press is much more than a publisher. It's actually an attempt to move the landscape of publishing towards a more open and values-based uh, approach. And uh, that means investing in all kinds of uh, tools and services and Fulcrum is one of the really exciting deliveries out of the first few years of the Lever Press's uh, sponsorship by visionary, found, uh, uh, visionary institutions. So what Fulcrum is, is it's an entirely open source publishing platform built from a variety of modular open source tools and based on the Samvera Fedora infrastructure. Samvera Fedora is the library-based uh, software infrastructure that supports a lot of research data management repositories. Uh, and you'll see that that is how we've managed to make this such a multimedia rich experience for authors. Uh, we received some initial foundation funding from uh, the Mellon uh, Foundation. Um, and it really was a part of their vision that uh, got us started on the focus on multimedia, data-rich, digital-first publication of book-like things. That's a technical term. 
Uh, so it really is responding to the fact that as we work with authors, we find that what they're interested in is not only publishing the results uh, in a book-like way to get credit, to get tenure, et cetera, but also being able to present all the data that they gather during their research and integrate the two. And Fulcrum is unique in presenting both parts. Uh, one of the exciting things we're working on at the moment is uh, developing a partnership with Janeway uh, at Birkbeck College in London. Um, and that will allow us also to, to, uh, to support journals. And that is going live uh, this month. Um, I want to talk uh, now uh, about some of the ways in which the values that you've heard about Lever Press uh, manifesting library-based values actually show up in the infrastructure of Fulcrum. So could I have the next slide, please? So uh, Fulcrum is now um, a sustainable uh, project in itself. It hosts over 10,000 books from more than 150 publishers, um, and it provides uh, a solution to other libraries and other library-based publishers for a way of publishing that is totally ethically aligned with their values. It is uh, uh, almost the only publishing platform for books which is entirely open source and non-commercial. And it also has a partnership with Lyricis, again, a library-based organization, a membership organization, to allow uh, publisher partners to sell collections as well as hosting open access if they need that for sustainability. Uh, next uh, slide, please. The Fulcrum architecture is modular, as I mentioned, and this is a rather busy slide, but you can see that Fulcrum itself is made up of several different uh, open source uh, community products. And what, it, uh, what the developers at Michigan do is they're constantly contributing open source code back to these other projects to make them more sustainable. And then in terms of workflow, uh, you'll see that the author uh, can submit through the Janeway system for uh, peer review, um, can move into the editorial system for uh, production, and then preservation and access is provided by Fulcrum. And then they can read in the Simply e-reader from New York Public Library or through the Rebus Foundation. And they can add annotation through Hypothesis, an open source tool, and have the authentication through uh, Humanities Commons. It's just I'm going through all of those because those are all open source community uh, developed uh, softwares and uh, platforms. Uh, but of course, we do link into uh, the commercial partners, EBSCO, ProQuest, um, uh, and uh, Clocks, and well, Portico. So commercial and non-commercial partners that we need to actually do our business. Uh, and you can see at the bottom here, the code base is all uh, openly licensed, available for other partners to use. Um, next slide, please. So there are some core values that uh, are manifest through Fulcrum. The first is flexibility, and this uh, feeds a lot into what uh, Darren and Beth were saying about various different innovations that readers will find as they work uh, with the books uh, hosted on Fulcrum. So flexibility is a lot about annotation. It's a lot about multimedia. It's a lot about being able to uh, play videos from within the text of the book. Um, to be able to uh, mark up passages in a class uh, together using hypothesis, and uh, to be able to integrate many of the resources connected to books into an open educational resource environment. So many of the videos, for example, get reused in courses separate from the book as well. So next slide, please. Uh, durable, it's hard to uh, provide an exciting looking slide for the preservation and digital preservation um, parts of what Fulcrum does. But as we know as librarians, it's absolutely core to uh, the future of this kind of publication that it's preserved. And so we work very closely uh, with clocks particularly to develop ways of preserving every new type of output that Leverpress creates. And this is just a workflow from a particular project with Portico and with Clocks to uh, develop workflows for digital preservation of Lever Press publications. Uh, next slide, please. 
accessibility isn't an afterthought and it can't be an afterthought. Uh, you really do need to build in accessibility at the point that a platform is being first developed. And that is what Lever Press was able to do working on Fulcrum. So accessibility uh, comes in terms of the platform, it comes in terms of the content. And there's a particular focus on accessibility um, of multimedia content, so video and audio. And uh, there is a, a, a public uh, explanation of exactly how accessibility is managed on the Fulcrum site at fulcrum.org uh, forward slash accessibility. Next slide, please. And here's a really busy slide. So this is uh, just to illustrate how much work Lever Press has had to do to really open the landscape and uh, open uh, awareness of the particular challenges for open access books. So without Lever Press's work, many of the uh, pathways for discovery of open access books that now other open access publishers are able to take advantage of would not have been opened up. And this slide shows some of the working that Lever Press staff have done to actually make sure that different vendors, different library discovery vendors, uh, different aggregators are taking open access books seriously. And that is the contribution that the funders of Lever Press have made to the whole landscape. That is how Lever Press shifts the whole landscape, sometimes behind the scenes without people realizing it. I wanted to highlight a couple of interesting projects we're currently involved in. One is to make sure that Lever Press titles are available in public libraries. And we're doing this through DPLA Bookshelf, and that is about to go online. Uh, so that relationship with DPLA Bookshelf it will soon be announced. And the other one is working with Google on audio. So what we're hearing is many, many students would like to have audio versions of the books that they read. And of course, uh, people with disabilities or with uh, print impaired readers, they don't necessarily uh, actually uh, get certified with disabilities. I mean, uh, uh, they actually want to be able to buy books, audio books, get hold of audio materials uh, without having to go through lots of different hurdles. Um, and so we've partnered with Google on a project uh, which provides auto narration using AI tools to try and make it very, very affordable um, if not free, and in fact, all Lever Press titles are freely available as uh, uh, auto-narrated audiobooks. Uh, next slide, please. And that's me. So uh, I'll pass over to Marta to talk about yeah. governance. That's right. That's me. Uh, much simpler slide this time. <laughs> so um, uh, Lever Press was started on a remote work basis long before everyone became acquainted with Zoom. Um, we are spread all over the, the continent, our membership, our operations, our leadership. We're, we've never been all in the same place, except um, you know, we, we try when there's not a pandemic to have one annual meeting at University of Michigan with the oversight committee and the editorial board. But so um, it's worked really, really well. So here's the list of current Lever Oversight Committee members. As I mentioned at the outset, I was the chair last year and then rotated off at the end of my uh, three-year term. And uh, the benefits, I would say, of the governance model um, have been um, many and varied. So we've, we um, member directors have had a say in the decision-making and especially the fiscal oversight that, um, that's really been informed by the realities of our institutions. So the oversight committee members appreciated firsthand the need to reckon with the effect of the pandemics on our budgets. And, um, and we extended current memberships for a, a year using money that we had set aside for contingencies. Again, we knew firsthand what the pandemic was doing to our budget. So um, that, that was a um, really important uh, element of our shared governance. Um, and the beauty of being open access is that our decisions aren't driven by sales. And um, at the same time, we need to be sustainable. And, and that is a constant theme in oversight committee meetings. How can we make sure that Lever continues to exist um, in coming years? 
So here are our membership tiers. Uh, we are now basing our, our tiers on IPEDS materials expenditures rather than the size of a, a, an institution's budget. Um, and we're asking for three-year commitments rather than, and initially we had a five-year commitment for the first phase of Lever Press. And we, we realize again, um, as um, member directors that our institutions is very hard to plan out beyond three years. At the same time, we need to balance that with um, giving Beth uh, a stable budget for her to be able to sign contracts with authors and be able to assure authors, yes, we, we will be able to pay to, make, uh, to bring your uh, book project uh, to publication. And we've heard from some uh, members or prospective members that they would like to see or prefer to see um, us base our fees on the number of members. So like the Hathi Trust model where the more members you have, the less everybody pays. And I would just say that that's, that's certainly a possibility. A, a future oversight committee could decide that in the third phase uh, that we would change the model. But that, uh, that can only happen if we have an overabundance of uh, member libraries um, because of this need to ensure that we have a stable budget to make the kinds of commitments you have to make when you're um, operating a press. Uh, so um, before we open it up for discussion, I just want to leave you with uh, a few points, uh, again, to reiterate some of the values that undergird what we're doing with Lever Press. And the first is that Lever gives voice to the liberal arts in an open access environment that has focused more intensively on research at Research One institutions. And uh, that's not to say we don't all benefit from that um, side of, uh, of open access, we certainly do, but this gives liberal arts colleges or smaller institutions uh, that voice as well. And Lever provides, secondly, um, an opportunity for everyone, including smaller institutions, to support an open access initiative that's having a tangible impact on the future of scholarly publishing. Um, we are putting content out there, but as I hope it's becoming clear, we've also made um, some impact on the ways that um, everybody is able to do scholarly publishing. Thirdly, uh, our shared governance model ensures that libraries have a say in the future of the press, as opposed to just purchasing the content. And that's been really important to us because, you know, we, we can only put out so many uh, titles and um, that, that was uh, something that, um, that we on the oversight committee realized we really needed to, um, to, to change our thinking about what it means to make an open access investment. And that we're so used to, to talking about um, a return on investment in terms of what content we get for what we pay. And this is what influence are we making, are we having for what we're investing. Uh, and finally, Lever serves readers from anywhere, which as it turns out has been a huge advantage in a global pandemic where students at our own institutions may well have been unable to leave their home countries and come back for school. Um, and Lever also serves authors because we publish anyone whose work is good enough um, and in line with our values and we never charge them a fee to publish. And as Beth has pointed out, that's <laughs> that can come as a shock to them. Um, so uh, with that, I want to stop and open it up for questions. Please feel free, uh, use the chat or raise your hand uh, or turn on your video and wave your hand. Any of the above will work. I also wanna point out that you may have been contacted by someone already from Lever and you, if you do have questions after the fact, you're more than welcome to follow up with that individual, uh, or you can contact uh, any of the four of us who presented today and we'll be happy to answer questions as well. This could give me a chance to mention something that I forgot. <laughs> if, oh, of course, go for it. If people wanna think of questions. So another thing that makes us quite different is that we really are looking for interdisciplinary works. And so a lot of times at university presses, the proposed manuscript could be uh, really doing great scholarly work. It could be shedding light on a novel subject. But really, because decisions do have to not always fall in line with sort of a market based approach, there have to be uh, at least some books or 
<laughs> hopefully more than some that break even at university presses. And sometimes interdisciplinary works can be a fearful sort of thing because marketing departments might say, well, say something's on queer poli sci. Is it enough queer studies for those people to buy it? Is it enough poli sci for those people? And even thinking about institutional um, sort of support for books, obviously books are not selling their cloth copies like they used to as well. And so thinking about what books will be acquired um, is something that's really become key for traditional university presses. And that's something that we're thankfully not having to take into account. What we want is usage. We want there to be something that is valuable in the scholarship that people will access it, they will teach it, it will be adopted for syllabi, but we are freed from thinking about market constraints. And this is going to be, and it has been for both Amherst College Press and Lever Press, really something that has become prominent in the pipeline. There are some projects that just would not have found a good home necessarily, but they're incredibly good in their scholarship and that has been proven in peer review and at the faculty board. And so I think there's something to be said for access to this work that might not have found a place because it is so deeply interdisciplinary. And so I think that's something even just beyond small liberal arts colleges or smaller institutions, there are really big comprehensive universities that have tried to, you know, and Darren, the pen, all of these pen interdisciplinary centers, and this has become a focus as well at big comprehensive universities. Uh, you reminded me of another thing that um, I should mention. Uh, it, whether or not your institution is a member of Lever, you can download high quality MARC records from our website and include those in your own catalog so that your users are uh, perhaps more likely to come across them when they need them. Um, and that's if you go to the Lever Press website uh, to the about page, there's a section on discovery and reuse and there's a link right there. We're so glad that you came. And we hope that you learned something and that uh, you know now how to reach us if you're uh, interested in getting on board. You're very welcome. We love to talk about this. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.